also gaps. Uh, very quickly, we thought that there was a lack of gender-specific skills um, among donors, but also others. So um, we talked about a lack of skills to do analysis, but also a lack of skills in terms of to be able to do programming. Um, so for example, the kitchen garden example, where um, you know, some people might do kitchen gardens for women's activity because they think it's a good program. Okay, put them up one more time and look around. Pretty strong agreement with some disagreement and some uncertainty. And I'm just going to make a little note here.
clearly something that doesn't work very well and maybe we need more innovation, maybe we don't, maybe we just need to do it better, but maybe we actually just need to also um, learn more about where, where we're you know, perhaps repeating mistakes. And we also talked about joint action, which is about the advocacy side. Um, well, you, you, you started to put the suitcase full of things here. Yeah, but, but I mean, let, let's just summarize this as, as mainly research. Maybe. A little more mixture there. Um, and finally, we, we talked about the need to address this framework issue. Um, and we talked about policy reform. Um, there was some conversation around the fact that we are in um, a unique situation at the moment where uh, we can use maybe post-2015 indicators to and, and link them with women's economic empowerment. Um, and use this as an opportunity to um, have joint advocacy. So uh, an example that was given was, okay, if country X, for example, has got a lot of challenges to women's economic empowerment in, in agriculture, um, you know, perhaps it's something that we can do to go to them as a global donor platform and say, you know, these are examples of ways that Things can change. So it's their joint yeah. influence. Joint influence. I mean, the platform is one opportunity to do that, but there are, I mean, there are other, other platforms as well. <laughs> and we also talked about joint policy priorities, but I can't remember what that means. Just when I think it's all one color, then the second wave starts putting up their colors and it gets more diverse. So this is an interesting, he's got all three of them. Okay, so that's. It's a little bit harder to discern. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, what I'd like to do is move through all four and then pick up on anything that really pushes your buttons, so to speak. So next we have a yellow. Here she comes. Thank you. So actually, I think there's some um, overlap already to an extent between what we talked about and the other group, which is quite nice, I guess, yeah, for, yeah, for our um, joint understanding. And the first thing we talked about is a lack of, as has been discussed a lot today, um, really understanding the context that women are living in and their own knowledge. Um, I, think, I think it was really trying to draw on, on existing sort of understandings of, of um, how to manage policy, this type of uh, knowledge that we don't necessarily fully draw on. Uh, okay. Agricultural 
uh, biodiversity, in particular existing knowledge um, that women do have themselves, for example, is a great opportunity um, for nutrition, for food security, um, and also for what was that? Uh, yeah. climate change, change adaptation, like maintaining you know, support for climate resilience and so on. Um, and we thought this is somewhere where we can hopefully try to map together an understanding of um, what people already know. With, I'm going to go down to the third point here. Oh, I'm sorry, let's check our biodiversity. Um, yeah, I will go to the third point because it relates a little bit more to this one, but we thought um, in the same sense that we're trying to uh, find this nexus between what can we learn from context and what can we really use from our own knowledge, we think education capacity building amongst women is really important to realise these opportunities that we see for agricultural biodiversity. Okay, green and yellow. Is there any reds there? That's the first one with no reds whatsoever. And finally, um, I mean, mapping onto this lack of political leadership, we sort of know that it's not a perfect solution, but we're trying to look for opportunities that we can really foster collective action at community level and hopefully creating a dialogue that moves it up with international policy. Yes. Walk the talk. 
I'm curious whether there will be any red for that. <laughs> ah, there's a red for that. Okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Being provocative or just, you know, you really think there shouldn't support concrete action? Well, which ones? Exactly. The, the whole ah, thing. Ah, ah, so that prioritization thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then we, when we talk about nutrition in this aspect, we had people that are recently going from being a recipient to being a donor, and we really need to think about if we are labeling our own consumer patterns over to some other societies, and we might need to study the consumer patterns and behaviors when we talk about food security and nutrition in developing countries. Do you mean exporting our bad habits? Yeah. Okay. We might be doing that sometimes. <laughs> I see some hands not up. I'm just kind no, of... No, I said the opportunity is to study, you know, these uh, links. Right? Yes. Thank you. Okay, one more. Yeah. We think that it's opportune to bring some more integrated value systems into play that you link things better. You know, I'm really interested. There's some people who use red cards a lot. I'm really interested in the There's opportunities to leverage um, uh, 
provide information and communication technologies uh, for women, for example, for market uh, information and behavior change messaging. So those were um, we really want effective partnerships. Okay. Hold on one second. Yeah. I just want to provide a short bonus round. The bonus <laughs> round. So um, where we started off was um, we tried to get onto the same page about what a food system meant. So to put our conversation in context. And we felt that that was really the purpose of the food system is to deliver food and nutrition needs to be good quality as well as sufficient quantity. Agriculture feeds in and um, it has a big impact on health. And uh, the system itself are the institutions and actors that make this possible. So that's everybody from farmers and um, scientists, households, markets, policy makers, etc. Would the environment be part of the system? Yes, absolutely. It's, sort of, it's all those pieces. So we just wanted to put our we felt it was quite important to put our dialogue in the context of um, the overall food system and how, how that works for women and how women's empowerment engages within that system. Okay, what do you think about their definition? So some, some definition some appreciation for them. So um, I'm going to, have you ever heard about private conversations in public? I'm going to do a private conversation in public. I'm going to have a conversation with two people, and you're going to get to witness it because I have a decision to make, and I, I'd like to include those two people in the decision because we could go into quite an extensive conversation about this, and or we can move to the next piece and then use the conversation. So I'm looking at Duncan and Esther. Esther, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. So we had invited, and we have invited, Duncan and Esther Mead to just reflect on what they heard. And I was going to do that after some conversation, but my intuition is to let you two comment, because you may actually distill a number of things. And then we have a, we'll have just a few minutes for some concluding conversations about, what does this mean? You know? It, it, you know, at the types of gaps and opportunities, and the difference in levels of specificity, um, and how we agree or disagree or see similarities. So, is it okay if I call you guys first? Okay. So we're going to bring two chairs up here so you can be comfortable. I'm going to give you the mic. In about 10 minutes, max. But if you're shorter, that's okay. No, 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 10 minutes total. I cut, I cut your time there because we're a little bit behind. So, and, and then we can negotiate more from each other. Who wants to start? They'll point to each other. I knew they were going to point to each other. <laughs> You're closer to the mic, so I'm using the default of geolocation. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think this has really been a very interesting session and really illuminating in, in the variety of issues that have come um, from the working groups. Uh, but I, my interpretation of this session was that you want to hear from us what the global donor um, platform should focus on um, and how it could use its membership to do things in the ground. So I, I will start by saying that the, the good news is that what I've heard is everybody is in agreement that we need action. Um, but the difference is, I think the actions are different levels. So we are seeing actions that are really like micro, micro level, and we're seeing the macro level actions. Um, in my view, I think that as a global donor platform, um, you have a wonderful opportunity to influence issues at a strategic level um, in your ability to engage in platforms. Uh, at the international um, uh, level, but also engagement with governments. Um, I think also that there are other platforms where development partners meet, and you have to make a difference. What you want to be like, and you like the other ones, what is your value addition? And in my view, I think that value addition should be picking on substantive issues and supporting them. And that does not mean that the global, the global platform is the one 
implementing those issues, but you are working with institutions to be able to deliver on those substantive issues. So, for instance, you could support the work that FAO is doing, you could support the work that NEPAD is doing, like the program that we presented yesterday. So, as a group, and somebody used that word, joint action, as a group you can endorse an idea and a program and then support it. Um, on the issue itself, the subject that we are discussing today, I think we should step back and look at this gender empowerment, um, not just as an issue of agriculture, but an issue of rural transformation and development. And I think if we place that in that context, we can each, um, address the critical issues that is all about equity, right, and justice for women. Um, participation in the economic life of their countries. So, if we look at it from that perspective, then we should be supporting issues of governance at all levels. So, political governance that encourages participation, um, governance at the level of the communities. Uh, we hear a lot about the role of traditional leadership. So bridging that and, and providing those linkages between political and, and traditional systems, I think is important, particularly, in the, I'm speaking as an African. From an African perspective, it is very important that we make those linkages and support um, the, the, the creation of space where we can have active dialogue amongst the different uh, stakeholders and players in the community. For me, the focus is about um, communities because that is the space where any empowerment of women um, will make sense. And to also make the point that uh, when we talk about empowerment, my, I would like to say, as Monique said earlier, African women have a lot of knowledge and they have a lot of power. I can assure you that. It's not seen up front, um, but behind the scenes, they really have a lot of power. What we are talking about is capacitating them, helping them, creating the space that they can express themselves better, they can use that power better, and they can deliver uh, for their communities, well, for the families, for their communities, for, for their nation. So, um, I think empowerment, that word is very good, but I think women have power. What women need is to get that space to be expressed, that power that they have, the potential that they have, and for that to happen, let's look at the government governance systems that are there, let's look at the support in terms of policies. Um, yesterday we spoke about positive discriminatory policies. Those policies that can help empower these women to, whether it's participating in the market, whether it's taking goods to the market, whether it's addressing the issue of post harvest laws. Let's look at that. I, 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 I always remember um, some years ago when I used to work in WWF, we visited a project on the field and we were working on a bushmeat project, telling communities not to eat bushmeat. Um, and the, the lady whom we spoke to, she said to me, you know, my daughter, I am really glad that you, you people are here. Um, and I would like to have a daughter like you, who have gone to school and can go and, and see these things. But I have all these crops I grow here, the plant beans, I cannot take it to the market because there are no roads. I don't have access to grow my small uh, resources to grow my small businesses because I don't have uh, 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 collateral to get free. So we know the issues. I would just like to leave this conversation to say we also know some of the solutions. The issue of how do we deliver on those solutions. So actions, 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 and let's think about the best mechanism to deliver on the solutions that we know are there um, and look for experiences in other places that have some solutions and bring them to our communities so that um, they can either adopt them, replicate them, 
um, we've got a paper outside called Meaningful Action, which is, which is uh, I don't think it's massively radical, but I think that we, along with many others, have already worked out what, what an enabling environment should be. So do we really need to work it out all over again? We should just be um, prioritizing it. It, it. it maybe came back like in one group, maybe in the green group. Um, now, I would say that um, in strengthening women's land rights is an important one. A lot of people have mentioned it during the day here. Obviously, I'm going to mention it because that's the program I'm promoting. Um, in the, the 35 or so countries where Oxfam has uh, land programming, uh, strengthening women's land rights is nearly always um, a key component of it. Um, and, and it would be, we believe that that's really a key way of empowering women. And it would be great if that was taken up or looked at more closely by, by the platform. And I, I think it came back a little bit maybe from one of the groups. None of them, companies take a systemic approach to gender. And I did see in the green and blue groups re referring to this. I got, is that two minutes? Oh. I can do that. Um, yeah, so, you all know, or well, many of you will know that Oxfam <coughs> run a campaign to challenge the food and beverage companies, the biggest ones in the world, to tackle issues like land and gender and, and climate. And uh, the biggest companies in the world, the, the ones that were sourcing a lot of the commodities that are being uh, uh, exported from developing countries, uh, are very, very far behind in this area. And they, it's not a question yet of whether they put in systems, in, although we have some great examples today, in most cases it's about whether they have yet understand, understood and analyzed these issues in their own supply chains. So, and there are some big ones that have now made commitments on this, like Nestle and Mars and Mondelez. Um, but there's a long way to go. At the moment we're still at the level of uh, commitments, and it really needs to be turned into action. Um, so, there's a lot more to be done in that area. And finally, and I know someone mentioned it earlier today, making, promoting women's land rights or women's rights explicit in any program design. How is this program going to promote uh, women's rights? That's you know, a central thing. I didn't really hear it coming back here, but I would have thought that it would be a relatively obvious one for, for donors to take up. Because, because our experience is that by making it explicit, then you get better outcomes, which, which uh, more equitable outcomes in, in the end. Um, okay, I've got two things and then I'm going to stop right So, one thing I felt slightly uncomfortable about, but it's also something that Oxfam struggles with, is the issue of influencing. If some, one of the groups mentioned about the need to influence uh, developing country governments. Um, Oxfam does this too, and we're also lobbying and directly trying to convince developing country governments. But I think that it, it has to be done in parallel at least for taking into account uh, uh, the aspirations and the demands of, of the people in those countries themselves. I mean, obviously you take into account what the governments want, but let's be frank, we also need to support the voice of the populations. And I hope that um, uh, as a donor group, you think about ways to support um, women's efforts to find their own voice and claim their own rights. So I'll raise that one again. And then I'm going to, my last point is about something which my colleague Laura from, uh, Laura from the Slow Food uh, mentioned this morning, is the, that there's a big systemic challenge here. That even with all of these in, in initiatives and programs that, that the donor group can um, set up and, and, and put into in, into, into process, that, that, you know, that, that they may not actually challenge the bigger systemic issues that are on the table, and I don't know how the donor group tackles it, so it's a, not, another dilemma for us all. Um, if the dominant model in agriculture remains large-scale, land-intensive um, investments around the world, these are, these are uh, a model which generally takes women's land away, um, and it's a model which tends to uh, give women low-paid, low-quality jobs. If that's the predominant model, which, which all the political elites support, then how, how are these programs that we're going to do going to end up challenging 
um, that major challenge to women's economic empowerment. So that's a challenge which I'd like the Diamond Group to think about too. Thanks very much. Sorry for talking so long.